care technician and has practiced in veterinary hospitals for seven years prior to opening CAF. These skills have come in handy for helping to care for the many animals that come through CAF's doors. From spay and neuter assistance to summer programs, CAF has helped to make our community more vibrant, not only for the animals, but for thousands of animal guardians as well. And I have a definite personal experience with this. Um, we adopted Andy. And I think she had a hard time letting Andy go. He's a little uh, 10 inch high at the withers. <laughs> White poodle. That when we got him, he was five pounds because she picked him up when she went down to uh, Mills College with her daughter taking That's her right. to school and went over to Oakland uh, Humane Society and brought home, what, 10 small dogs because we didn't have very many around here. So I lucked out. I got Andy after six weeks of rehab and he still only weighed five pounds. And he now weighs what he ought to weigh, which is around nine pounds. So that's what kind of shape he was in. And we're so appreciative. He was, we figure, about two. And he's absolutely adorable. Okay, Kim, wow. it's, all yours. it's all yours. Well, Jane, after an intro like that, I think I had a whole series of peacock feathers blooming behind me or, or rays coming out of the top of my head. Thank you. Wow, that was, it was a delight. And this is what probably brings me the greatest joy. And is adopting to people and running into people at Costco and, and Ollie Talks. And I know Marty out there, I had the pleasure of working with Marty for over six years. Sue, I see you had the pleasure of doing a total of four, adopting a total of four animals too. I have people that we've adopted seven and eight animals too, but that's a lot because we've been around in the community for a long time. Um, where were we when Companion Animal Foundation got started in 2002? So we were not in a good place in the county. I was on the board of Sequoia Humane Society, who at that time, they obviously have not done this for, you know, practically since 2002. But at that time, they were the euthanasia facility, the kill facility in Humboldt County. And I was on the board when we decided we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to get rid of the drop boxes because drop boxes allow somebody to sneak in in the night and dispose of their animals. And the, the greatest missing component here is compassionate education. And that's one of the gifts that I believe Companion Animal Foundation offers. Education to us is not a token word, just a thing. It is really looking at everybody's situation individually. And if we can, working together with people. I will never ever call the work we do rescue. I don't believe we're a rescue. And the reason is, is because rescuing implies somebody's a hero. And then somebody else actually can kind of get off the hook. So I, people always want to hand me this rescue cape. Oh, Kim, can you take these 15 cats? I've heard wonderful things about you. And I said, well, they're all lies because I'm not taking them. So the, the thing, what I believe we excel at is seeing the best in each individual. And, and when we can really stepping in, if your best is $10, then that's great. I can really sense when that's the best that somebody can do. Um, sometimes people's best is way more than they might even believe in themselves. And that's where we really are good at figuring out what that is. Um, and I know, Marty, you know this from working there. We've worked with a lot of people in a lot of different situations. So where were we then? Where were we before Corona? And I'm going to talk about a little bit about where we are today, just four months later. So back in 2002, 2000, we'll say 2000, we were euthanizing about 5,000 animals every single year in Humboldt County. Um, that is an absolutely atrocious number. We do not have an animal problem. We have zero animal problem as far as I'm concerned. It's a people issue, right? So when we all know better and we have the resources to do better and it's offered and we're supported and loved, we typically will choose that path, right? Sometimes it's a lack of education or resources or 
knowledge. And as long as, here's what I say to everybody. If you call me on the phone and I want to share something with you, what I'm going to say to you is, if you feel I'm judging you, just hang up on me. That keeps it really clean. That keeps us really equal, right? Even though I have all this knowledge and I want to see where you're at and what we can do to work together, that does, I'm no better. Nobody is, right? So that's how we approach each situation. That's how I approach each situation. So here we are with euthanizing about 5,000 animals every year. These are not um, big, nasty pit bulls that have just killed eight cats or you know, a dog that um, it's the gift of euthanasia, it's them and all the adoptable animals or treatable animals, right? Big gap in there to do a lot better. So I had a choice 18 years ago and that was to go work in a veterinary hospital, something that I was familiar with, um, or try to deal with this animal situation. So I don't know how many of you were around back then, but there was a big issue out in the South Jetty where everybody was asked to move. We did all the animal assistance for that. That was in like, I think 2001. So I, you know, I started to really connect up with a lot of the animal people in the community and um, Open Companion Animal Foundation because we recycle, it was a community hub is a community hub, which we are closing, and I'll talk about that later. Um, so in 2016, I write grants every year for spaying and neutering. At our animal shelter, we euthanized about 100 animals. So those of you that, you know, that, that 5,000 just, it just leaves me feeling like I've been sucked in my stomach. You know, that is, you know, every single animal to me has a face, has the potential. Do we, do we shine a light on them and give them that potential and bring them into our lives? Well, we can't take them all, right? So we spay and neuter. So that's what we started doing right out of the shoot. We opened up the thrift store and bam. So we are over 8,000 spays and neuters into this now. So just one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Everyone that's before us, we find out what's the, what can they do? We give a voucher. If they still can't do it, we up the voucher. And this is from funds from the thrift store, but primarily it's from funds from through Humboldt Area Foundation. A couple left some money and we all work with that every year. Um, so where are we now with coronavirus? It's gotten a little interesting. For about the last four years, most of the people that have called me, if I feel like they can't deal with their situation because maybe they don't have the knowledge or the skills, those are the ones that I gravitate towards and take their animals. If somebody seems really skilled, they just maybe don't want to bother. Those are the ones that we try and help and give vouchers and help get their animals fixed and stuff. So coronavirus, I have now had to refuse. Um, I don't know if it's just because we've gotten popular and most of the kittens have gravitated toward us because I've committed now I've got about 50 kittens. And that is the most I've ever had in the last 18 years. And I have some, you know, not as many dogs. I do I either balance it out and we'll do 20 kittens and 10 puppies or dogs or maybe more puppies and dogs and almost no kittens or kitties, or right now it's primarily kittens because that's the need. There's, you almost can't find a dog or a puppy in Humboldt County. People are, it worries me because I, I know that then breeders will start to be seriously looked at. And I don't have a problem with anybody getting the dog they want. That's none of my damn business, right? If somebody wants a Springer Spaniel, go for it. What worries me is the unscrupulous breeding. You get a Springer Spaniel that um, has heart issues and it turns out that people just got them cheap and bred them. That's what worries me, is that there starts, there's the lack of care because there's such a great need for money and for that animal. I don't, it's never anybody's business what kind of a dog you want. That's, that's such a personal thing. Um, so here we are, we're running the thrift store. We, we've done, I love that, Jane, you said hundreds of animals adopted. We have just now hit about 2,500. And every single animal that comes into us is spayed or neutered, 
has at least one fecal, sometimes three or more. They've had all their first vaccines. They've been microchipped in lifetime registration. They've been dewormed, defleed, and leukemia and AIDS tested. With dogs, we often have to run Giardia and Parvo tests. So there is a huge amount of comprehensive care and cost going into every animal. And I wish I could take a tally now. I am really curious at those of you out there, you're on here, you know, maybe it's something to do, but I'm guessing some of you have animals. I know some of you have animals, but I'm really interested if you chat with, with Kim, the moderator, I'm curious at what your concerns are today in regards to your animals and the climate, not only of coronavirus, are any of you having trouble? I just read a big rant on Facebook today. And the rant went something like this. I am worried. I am frustrated. Um, these people have a few kitties and uh, they are struggling with finding a vet appointment. And I am hearing that so much. Uh, that's a real true rant and a justified one. A lot of people are struggling and it's not, there's no blame here. It's just that we have to look at our situation because I think this was really building prior to Corona. Um, there's a real valid situation. Some practices aren't open as much. People like myself, I lost all my staff when coronavirus hit, every one of them for various reasons. Um, so there's a lot of things going on personally with people. Maybe they have a sick loved one or whatever, but the fact is pertaining to animals, it is causing some issues with people just trying to get basic care. Um, let alone emergencies, and the emergency visits are are a little bit costly. And my concern is is that I know a lot of people are on a fixed income. So I'm I'm curious if you all, um, Kim. I don't know if anybody's responded. Uh, what, so somebody's somebody's messaging me. I'm curious what issues you might be having, and I'd like to hear about those and brainstorm and see if we can come up with any ideas today, because that's what I love to do. I want to talk a little bit more about, um, and I also, I'm curious from everybody, what you think about people who can't afford having pets, should they have a pet? I'm, I'm a little opinionated on this. I will tell you that I respect everybody's opinion. I feel like everybody should have an animal because I know that <laughs> they bring me so much joy. So if they bring me joy and companionship, and I have a 17 year old son at home, husband, I'm very busy. Imagine if I maybe didn't have all that in my life, um, even the meaning would be different then. So I'm curious at what everybody's thoughts are. I do get a bit of hearing, well, if people can't afford an animal, maybe they shouldn't have one. And that's, the words sound, maybe they make sense, but they don't, you know, because animals are, they need you, you we all need them. So I, I'm just a little curious on that if, if people agree with me or, so what do we do? If we have an animal that we can't afford, you know, what do we do in the climate of coronavirus, rising costs, you know, just, just the inflation going on? And, and I know vets can seem expensive, but as a vet tech and working in a hospital, it is so incredibly expensive to run a hospital. One of the reasons why I have to close down Companion Animal Foundation is because the rising costs of rent payroll, workers comp, we just can't do it anymore and be able to do some of the other work we need to do. So I'm getting very creative here. So our board sat and, and looked at this question of what we, so I don't know if any of you have ever been able to participate in years past. We ran it every other year. This would have been the year in April that we would have run it again. But we've run something called a I hesitate to say the word senior, <laughs> but um, you know, a senior day of caring is what we called it. And um, what we did is we took anyone in the entire county that was on a very restricted income and we offered a day of what we called love and caring 
not only for pets, but for their humans as well. And it, the last one that we did was so large. I had four veterinarians volunteering their time that it really confirmed that in October 2015, we started saving for a mobile veterinary unit. And it really confirmed that this is the path that we needed to go was to get this mobile unit. I am happy to say that we purchased the mobile veterinary unit um, this is where a, a presentation would have been good, although I don't have one. I'm it. Um, we purchased a 35 foot mobile for all of you. Um, it will be going around Humboldt County. It's not going to be parking at homes. It's going to be um, parking in neighborhoods. It's going to be called Community Veterinary Services. And we're going to bring affordable veterinary services to communities. And we've gotten a couple of uh, really nice grants, one that I applied for and another foundation that happened to read my grant and match that grant funding. So not only are we able to get the basics, I just ordered two anesthesia machines, I ordered an oxygen concentrator, I'm ordering today a wall-mounted dental unit, a very nice one. We'll be getting some equipment that'll run uh, chemistry panels and blood profiles. Um, there, it's going to be really a nice unit, and the missing link will be getting a veterinarian, but I need to woo somebody to come to Humboldt that not only can appreciate all of Humboldt, which I love, um, but can also appreciate the great gift that they will bring to the community. Um, we work a lot in Hoopa. I love the people in Hoopa. We've been well received. We have done a lot of spay neuter assistance um, out in Hoopa, as we've done everywhere. So I'm really excited to be able to take this onto the reservations. As long as we're welcome, we'll, we'll need to ask. Um, but just to take it to Southern Humboldt, up to Oric, um, all those things, and it's going to be lovely. <laughs> uh, what else is going on? Any questions so far, Kim? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of comments. One, um, Madeline Sims is um, interested in fostering kids, and she oh. wants to put the word out. And okay. then um, Kathleen Kinkley of Love is um, currently petless but is here today to find out what the process is for adoption. So it sounds like right. you're going to have some people who are this. interested. Those are excellent questions. People who want to know more. Right. So, yeah. I am going to first talk a little bit about our land and our summer programs because something interesting is happening right now. Um, and we're trying to figure that figure it out, the board is. So we, Companion Animal Foundation, was able to purchase 18 and a half acres up on Azalea about seven years ago, back when we could make money. <laughs> but I knew the woman. Uh, Marty, you've been out there. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, I see her shaking her head. Yay, Marty. Um, Marty has been amazing. May I say what you do, Marty? Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Marty. Marty raises guide dogs for the blind. You may all be familiar with Marty's amazing work and seeing her dogs paired up. So what we do is she's come out to the summer programs and talk to the kids. We usually run two programs. It's called For the Love of Animals, ages eight to 10 and 11 to 15. A couple years ago, the programs, are they got very impacted, and um, I did not run them this year. This is the first summer I have not been able to run them, strictly due to coronavirus, because I would have to take such small groups, and I try to buy gifts or pay the dog trainers, you know, things like that, and I can't take groups of any less than 25. Nor can I imagine standing out there in the field with a mask on all day. So I'm a little sad. The kids are very disappointed. We had a lot sign up this year, but yay, Corona. Ugh. Anyways, so what's happened is, is we actually have a school, a charter school that wants to do the first ever in the nation forest school out there. So that's in the works, stay tuned. I'm sure that we'll be, if we decide that this is doable, they'll learn all about permaculture and native plants and clear out some invasive species. We've discussed them building a tiny movable house that maybe we could you know, rent out up there to, 
to get some funding and they're going to set up tents and do that this this particular school is already headed in that direction with doing a lot of outside schooling side note but i i thought wow this is so interesting you know i think when we're all true to ourselves the the garden can really grow um, I don't know if all of you realize, but uh, at the end of last year, we opened up a new adoption center. So Kathleen, let's talk about this a little bit. I don't know what you're looking to adopt. And there was somebody else, I'm embarrassed, I did not write down your name that may want to foster. Was it Maggie or Margie or Marcy? Madeline. Uh, so the adoption center, what, what's the name? Are you gonna Madeline. Madeline. My apologies, Madeline. I'm going to write this down. The adoption center is so lovely. It's at the former Humboldt Spay Neuter Clinic site. And this, are any of you artists? If anybody's an artist, I've got the sign. <laughs> I've got I've got a sign that we need to paint. We got the base coat on it, and I have the paint. It's 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 in the same vein of the community veterinary services. We're doing a. It's going to be called Companion Animal Foundation Community Adoption Center. And the reason for it is once again, animals, they're not my issue. You know, I just had somebody get very mad at me because his dog had a, an issue and he was so mad at me because I wouldn't pay his vet bill. I just, I didn't have the money. And, and I do what I can, um, but it's, it's a community. This is all a community issue. I cannot take on all these issues personally myself, which sometimes I, well, often I do. So what this means is that I'm going to count on the community to show the animals to, I have people that are training right now and trained to do adoptions. You know, there's the whole checklist. I'm available 24 seven. Um, but it's, it's empowering people to do the good work. I'm not going to be here forever. And I want this to continue. And I just did a training out there on animal intakes. I taught everybody to vaccinate. They all got a kitten. And in the time of Corona, we all wore a mask. But I had some young girls in from Hoopa to carry the torch. And, you know, people, fosters in the community. And I had one gal there with the parents. She is 14. And in, um, so... We've got this great group of people up and coming that I want to make sure get trained and are passionate. Um, you know, I've got a couple of really strong people at the adoption center that are volunteering and I love them. So it's, so if anybody's interested in anything like that, maybe you say, well, I'm not interested in doing vaccines and, and this and that, but I would be interested in coming and welcoming guests in and signing them in. Everybody has to bring a photo ID and has to wear their mask, of course, and sanitize. And we have two guest rooms. So if somebody's in one, another little family could go in the other. But I would love all your help. You're, you know, this is a gathering of of people who hopefully have a passion for animals in some way or another. So it's, it's a consideration, I hope. Um, right now we're just open uh, Tuesday through Friday from 11 to 4. So stop by and see us. We've tried to make this space really cute and really functional. And um, I'm sure that Mike, who's out there every day, we've got Shannon, we've got Kelly, we've got Maddie. I'm sure they would be happy to give you a tour of the place if you ask. A whopping tour of the thousand square feet. <laughs> It's the world's shortest tour, but it's it's very it's a very sweet space. Um, Kim, so, before you get going, um, we have a couple more questions. Um, please. One person is wondering about if we can get the address and contact information. Yes. And then, um, can you just share a little bit more? It sounds like you're. Um, are you having to close down? Are you? Yes. Are you thank you. Once? Let me go back. To, yes. Yeah. So let yeah. me finish up. Uh, let's see. The address is 3954 Jacobs Avenue. It's the building right in front of the farm store. So if you all are coming from Arcata, you pass by the car dealerships, the Murrayfield Airport, and then you cross over the highway, which I know is not everybody's cup of tea. You can come the other way and you just get off at that last exit right there before the airport and you drive through those ivy cover, covered fence, go right through the gate and you almost go right up to our building. It's got the big horses, the big Dwayne Flatmo mural on the side. Um, I wanted to address Kathleen's question. Um, 
so Kathleen, our adoption process is you fill out, you can get it online. We have them there. You fill out, uh, it's a page, it's an adoption form. And these questions are not, I just want to reiterate, um, these questions aren't asked to go, oh my God, they're going to declaw. We're not going to adopt to them. We, every single person in there has the attitude that if you walk through the doors, our very first thoughts are, I want to adopt to this person. That's the only thoughts I want in those first moments. Now, I will say that I've had one person in the last 18 years that even with kind and compassionate education on declawing, this person was still going to declaw and I am not going to have our kittens go through that level of pain. So I had to say no. But I've had a lot of people say they're going to declaw and then once they learn what it is, you know, one of the activities I do in the camp with kids is I tape their fingers like this and I, ha I do leave their thumbs out because I'm so sweet. And I have them um, eat their lunch with their fingers taped and they have no clue what's going on. They say, oh, why are you doing this to us? Uh, you know, I'm doing it to them. Their suffering is so profound. Um, and I say, oh, you know, just do your best. But I've got soup. I've got pasta. Just do your best. I always just say this, do your best. Just do your best. And then we're done. We take the tape off and we discuss how that was for them to be impaired and what it might be like for a cat that gets declawed because that last digit is taken off, right? It's cut clean. We declawed my cats growing up. I saw the blood seeping through and hiding under the bed and animals hide when they're in pain. And so now I know what that's all about. I probably guessed it then, but I was, you know, eight and nine. Um, so it's bringing a lot of empathy to the kids so that they, and then they do a PSA called keep your paws off my claws and they all come up with reasons why we don't, you know, because my claws belong to me or I need my claws for balance or to defend myself or catch my prey or, well, I didn't say that, not birds, um, just rats. So it's, um, so back to the application, it's once again, it just, and we say it right on there, you know, this is, this application is to match you up with some, an animal that's right for you. So what you do is you come in, we have people list in order. I've got six applications I just brought home and people know now, Mike educates them. He goes, don't just list one, list your four favorite in order. <laughs> Because what happens is I might be processing and, and, and an application on one of the other kitties might be approved, but then I've got another one that you really like. And sometimes, you know, it's good to go in a couple times. This isn't a like buying a pair of jeans, right? This is, a, this is hopefully a decision that will last for 15 or 20 years. It's, it's not a small one. Um, we do a lot of education on when you come in, so just be ready, not a lot, but just a little, it's actually a little, on um, playing or engaging with kitties. We unknowingly um, make kitties really nasty when they grow up. We don't mean to, but when we play with our hands and do this and poke at them and every interaction while their brains are developing, it, they really kind of grow up, can grow up to be pretty bitchy. Um, and nasty. And once they do that, we can't quite seem to pull that out of them, no matter how nice we are to them. So that and diet are really important. So we do touch upon that a bit. So nobody seems to mind. We try and make it really as fun as we can. Um, so after you fill that out, we, um, if somebody's renting, we do like to speak with the landlord. Um, and that's just because we've, you know, we have a lot of students here. When people are more mature, I'm probably a little less likely to worry about calling a landlord, but there's, and not to pick on the students, but there is a bit of leftover cats when the year ends and um, we hear about them and sometimes, you know, deal with them and work with situations. So we do like to know, and we've been thanked if any of you have property that you rent out, a lot of the landlords are really appreciative. And we take that opportunity to say, hey, our cats are great litter box users and we fix them and we deworm it, you know, and so we can actually talk about our kitties with the landlords and everybody gets a nice file. So Kathleen, you've picked out your animal. You, um, then I'm gonna call you, that animal has to be fixed. 
um, I'm gonna call you and we're gonna set up an adoption time. So you're gonna come in and meet with most likely myself or our wonderful Kelly and hopefully some other people that are uh, getting trained. And then you just sit, you get um, a coupon book. We talk to you about the microchip and lifetime registration. Um, we talk about all of that. And then you bring a carrier, a clean carrier, because sometimes they've just been fixed. And then we take a photo. <laughs> and then we say blessings because everybody, I just, I've got seven Siamese kittens coming in tomorrow at, at 10 a.m. So this is a, a you know, a difficult situation. We've already taken kittens from here, but here's the thing. I don't take kittens unless the mom dogs or puppies, unless the mom dogs or cats are spayed or get spayed. And we back that up with vouchers. So there's no, um, there's, you, we got to turn the faucet off. I don't have a bigger mop. So we turn that faucet off. We know that situation ends with that person. We, we love them up and know they're not going to do it again <laughs> because it's a hassle. Um, so that's how we, that's how we've worked. And it's, you know, obviously like this puppy was found wandering the streets in Hoopa. So I don't have a mom dog to spay, but we do our best uh, to make sure that population ends with that dog. So I'm going to skip on to the thrift store and talk about this. I am saddened when I talk about it. So um, how many times have I cried now? Only three? Okay. Um, I love that store and it has been such a hub of community activity and I've gotten to meet the most spectacular people I could ever hope to meet, have come in the doors, have adopted. We used to have our kitty place there which got to be way too much. I couldn't keep staff because the intense amount of activity in there around the kitty place and the thrift store was people were like, oh my gosh, you need to pay me $100 an hour for me to do all this. It really was a lot. It was a lot of work. It's the good work, but it still is a lot of work. We're all exhausted. So that's one of the reasons we moved the animals. But it's, like I said, the cost of things, I would consider possibly opening up a smaller space that's more manageable. Here's the thing. I really need a landlord that I respect and like, um, because I really like and respect myself and all the people I work with. And I really want to give money to somebody for rent that I really like. And um, I don't want to say much more on that, but that's my only thing. And we have been phenomenal tenants these past 18 years. Um, we're funky, a little on the funky side, but you know, I guess I tend to gravitate towards funky a bit. Um, so that's really the reason workers comp, our rent is just going up. We're paying about $2,700 a month in rent right now. And with, you know, the one rise that I am really happy about is payroll. I always try and pay over the minimum wage now. Um, but with that comes higher workers comp. It's, um, I go to employee law meetings every year. And I don't know if any of you were at the one last year, this year, of course, there wasn't one, but um, he said, you're all crazy for opening up businesses in California. And I went, oh, that was a great positive note to start this on. Um, it's, it's a challenge to run businesses. And I mean, we're blessed because it's been a nonprofit. So we get maybe a couple breaks here and there, but um, the community's really pulled through for us. And like I said, with the mobile, I'm getting donations that I haven't asked for. And that is, that's a really incredible thing. That just, I'm going to die with a, a big ass smile on my face. That's what I have to say is that this has been good, a good life and sorry, <laughs> my language. Um, I'm going to die with a big old smile on my face. Let's, let's reword that let's scratch the last one. Um, so that's why it's a sad ending, but I'll tell you, for those of you that are bargain shoppers, I still have rooms. It's going to close at the end of September. Um, maybe that the latest mid October is when I put in, but we'd like to have the doors closed and just more of the equipment type stuff selling at the end. But right now there's great sales going on and I still have two more rooms to put out. So there's a lot of fun stuff going out and people are, you know, and people can always donate more. I'm not opposed to somebody feeling like 
you know, they've cheated us by getting a lot of stuff really cheap and you can always throw more money at us. I will never say no. Um, go ahead and make me cry. Um, what other questions? Any more? I've talked all of your ear off and... <laughs> I'm sorry, and maybe, and maybe you answered this and I missed it. Um, Jane was wondering, are you guys planning to reopen the thrift store? Well, like I said, Jane, it's going to be a matter of a good match for me in particular. I really want to, if we reopened, it would not be nearly as big. It would be, so we're in about 2,000 square feet now. It would be more like five to 600, smaller, more manageable place where people can come and get their pet tags made. By the way, we do pet tags for $5, if any of you need them, a place where people could come and get their vouchers. Otherwise, this stuff will just go out to the adoption center and, and um, that's the way we'll do it. Uh, so we'll just, we'll just have to see how things go. Um, you know, we did something called an enchanted animal walk um, the fall before last. And my son was a storyteller that didn't believe in magic. And it was so sweet because he rambled on about some inconsequential story about him catching a massive fish in Mill Creek of all things, because our land Mill Creek runs through it. And then he asked all the kids, he said, he heard something. And he said, oh, it's, her I've heard that there's magic out here. And he said, magic foo. He said, do any of you believe in magic? all the kids started yelling they all believed in magic and honestly i hope you all do too because i sure do um so jane the answer to your question is who knows <laughs> i don't know which way these magical winds blow <laughs> so i hope that's good enough <laughs> any other questions oh my gosh I, I'm that's rambling. good that's good enough kim I want you to talk a little bit, if you would, about um, seniors and, and yeah. having companion animals during this particular period and the benefits. It's critical. I mean, that's what I'm going to tell you. Having companionship right now, if any of you honestly are feeling lonely, my gosh, I am a, I'm a great companion. <laughs> come tell and see, come see me. Um, just bring your ID, bring your mask, just come in and sit with the kitties. I am hard pressed to find a solemn face in our adoption rooms. Companionship right now is, it's especially important. This, this virus has changed us all. Yeah. Our adoption fee is $150 and we don't make back what we put into the animals. Really, though, if somebody came to me and said, you know what, Kim, I just, I can't stand it. I have to have an animal. I, I don't, I don't know what I'd do. Come and talk to me. I, I don't want having an animal to be some elitist thing, right? It, it shouldn't be. I would rather people spend their money on, um, you know, good food and, and other things. Um, that's really important. Okay. So it, that's a great question, Jane. And I mean, I'm go, go, go all the time. And, and I do have to be careful because of a member of our household with this coronavirus. I do have to be very careful. But my animals <laughs> are, are just wonderful. We just set up a koi pond in the backyard. And all I want to do all day long is sit out there and watch them. It is the most relaxing thing. I think that koi pond has lowered my blood pressure a little bit. It's been, there's, you know, they, there's so many studies now that just petting an animal, how calming that is, you know, just touching them, just seeing them look at you, just, we depend on each other. I mean, it's, it is absolutely unconditional love. Some days I really actually smell bad. You know, my dogs think I'm even better. The riper I am, the better I am. You know, they don't care. <laughs> oh, too much information, sorry. Have you um, considered setting up a, a, an outdoor facility basically at your property? It's on Azalea Hill, right? 
It's actually on Azalea. Yeah, it's the old Schroeder Swamp. It belonged to Karen Jerry Brockoff, who had the Greyhounds. Um, huh. Tom, tell well, me, you, you, you tell me what you that. saw. Tell me what was in your mind when you when you said that. What do you see? Well, people can safely be outside at distances with masks. And if you had a way of having, if they had greyhounds there, you could have dogs and cats there, but you'd have to get grant money to set it up. Or I don't know if it's already set up for keeping animals. No, it isn't. Greyhounds. So it's, it's such open space. I would have to put, so think about a cat and trying to hold it outside. That's like trying to hold, you know, an eel. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, kittens are, you know, they have, they have two speeds, go and stop. I mean, there's not really much in between. So trying to snuggle a kitten or a puppy, you know, all I can say is I just wish you all the best of luck. Um, so being outside is tricky. I mean, you know, there's definitely our, let me give everybody our phone number out there and what we can do to keep you safe is, you know, making sure that we're cleaning. We have a really great product that people didn't catch on to. I was just at the Western Veterinary Conference and I forgot, it's called Rescue. It's accelerated hydrogen. And we clean with that. We clean with um, something called trifectant. We have really the cleaners recommended by UC Davis. So I'm sure you all know that coronavirus is a non-envelope virus. It's actually a pretty easy virus to to kill. Um, it works both ways, I suppose, if, if I was a coronavirus. Um, it's, so us cleaning is, you know, that's paramount there. And we do, you know, cats have coronavirus, dogs have coronavirus. Isn't that interesting? So with cats, they're doing a study right now to try and um, uh, find a vaccine for it. Dogs, it's already part of the vaccine component. So, um, and it's a really horrible virus in cats. It's horrible. It mutates to something called FIP, which is feline infectious peritonitis, and it's it's 100% deadly. But it doesn't always mutate. It really depends on the strain that you get in. So as far as people coming into the adoption center, um, what I would do is I will talk to everybody over there and just saying, you know, just please do an extra cleaning for me. Um, I don't really, I mean, outdoors would be really indoors to keep the animals safe. When we do summer camps up there, I literally go up and set up the entire field, right, Marty? We've got the three-person tent. We've got, you know, pop-ups. I'm hoping to get one of those nice big Costco, um, the, the hardcore ones that maybe something could be wrapped around that. I love the idea. Honestly, Jane, I hadn't quite thought of it. The parking lot over at the adoption center, because the tea lab is right there, it is pretty busy. So we do have dog, uh, pretty good sized dog kennels um, that were donated to us out there, but I still can't see. I, we could try putting a kitten in and see what, seeing what happens and bringing animals out to people. I think what we really need to do though is give, if somebody comes in a person or a couple, give you your own room. I have no problem doing that. I like it to enjoy. It seems to me that you could um, get a grant potentially to get a couple of like backyard sheds um, and they come in various sizes with windows and doors and second floors and all kinds of things. And if, if you could build- we'll move you all in. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? I'm going to move you all in. So what would be... I, well, I mean, you wouldn't can, have to pay rent if you did it on your own property. Oh, you are saying replace the whole adoption center with something up on the land. That's interesting. Or not That's necessarily replace it, um, but add to it so you could have your summer camp activities there right. so that you could have training for people. Um, if you, and, and maybe you could totally decrease your costs. I don't know what your rents are. <clears throat> it's not bad out there. Doc, Doc Johnson has been lovely. He really has. He, I've known him for a long time and 
he knows I've been very dedicated to, to him and, and stuff. So he's kept the rent down to something that's breathable and reasonable. And I'm very grateful. <laughs> and I don't know what they're doing with that property. They've closed the farm store. There's that yes. huge barn it's back too, there. It's very expensive back there, unfortunately. Um, it's something that, you know, could be exciting, but they're going to be doing a lot of work there on the highway too. Everybody should be aware of that as I am, which could, which could impact us, you know, out there. They're doing something, you know, there's a lot of work going on and mm. it's not the safest to be heading north from Eureka right now. There's a lot of... In, very quick stopping and going if any of you haven't traveled that yet be very careful um, i worry about everybody so i hope that some of you come in i i really honestly have no idea how many are on the talk and and um how many of you have signed in today but i'd love to meet every one of you if i haven't met you already you have 19 thank signed in right now thank you <laughs> thank you I do have a question about um, how you plan to staff your vet. Oh, uh, good. Oh, vet. thank you. Uh, Whoever wants to know that, if it wasn't you, Jane, thank you. If that's a question from you, thank you so much. The point of this mobile is to one of the, okay, the point, you know, the main point is to provide affordable services. We can't do it for free. You know, insurance is going to be high. Gas is going to be high to haul around a 35 foot mobile. Um, but the other point is, is that I've had the, the privilege of having some pre-vet students come and work with us over at Companion Animals. So we want to take on pre-vet students so that they can get some training as well as vet tech students. So I'm a vet tech. So they would, the understanding is that when we find that right veterinarian and I know they're out there, they, they have to have a strong passion for people, a strong passion for animals and a strong passion for teaching. So, Marty, say you decided that you were going to go to veterinary school and you said, you know, this could really work for me to get in my needed hours. I'm going to start now. I know Kim. I'm going to do weekends on the mobile and put in some hours. So because we're going to be offering more services than most. So this mobile we bought in San Antonio, Texas. We drove it back today. These mobiles, it only had 16,000 miles on a Freightliner motor. These mobiles are designed to go well over 300,000. Just so you know, today, this is, I am, I am a penny pincher. Today, these mobiles cost $330,000 new. We bought it for $48,500. Everybody wanted this mobile, but they made the mistake of hitting make an offer and I hit bid full price. <laughs> I was the only one that did that. I thought, no way, I'll make an offer if there's something wrong with it. So the whole point is, is that I want it big enough. You know, it's still a mobile um, and the sides pop up so we can use it to showcase adoptable animals. So maybe some of you say, well, I don't know, oh, veterinary practice, that's not really what I want to do, but I do want to do this. This is very interesting. You might want to come out and do an adoption event with it. You might say, wow, I'm a chatterbox like Kim and I love people just like Kim. I'm going to come out and sign people up. You know, so you would read the training. How do you sign people up? And as people come through, you sign them up, they go to somebody else who maybe helps them on the scale to weigh their animal. It's gonna be interesting. I want this to feel and be exceptionally friendly and welcoming. When do, you expect, want... it to, when do you expect it to be able to start functioning? Well, I need a little break once this thrift store closes to um, have a few moments for myself. That makes sense. Um, so, I, and I'm right now in the process. Like I said, tomorrow I pay for almost a $4,000 eight inch dental unit. Um, I'm waiting on the anesthesia machines and oxygenator to come in. I have a lot to get. So probably in October, I'll start okay. advertising for a veterinarian. There is, um, when you read about setting up things like this, it's incredible 
incredibly yeah, complicated. I tend to, oh, we'll do a mobile vet unit. And then the nitty gritty is it's a lot of work. So I think we'd be lucky to be able to have it up and running in six to eight months. Not soon enough, in my opinion. Um, Kim, there's a suggestion or a question about the possibility. It says that um, UC Davis has a pretty large vet school. Um, is ha Have you reached out to them? Is that something that you've considered? Um, I will duck, thank you for that. Yes, and not only that, UC Davis does something called RAVS. It's rural, at rural something veterinary, something or another. And they used to go out to hoop all the time and do free spaying and neutering, free vaccines. I mean, I know that sounds lovely. I always get, I do get a little concerned because nothing really is free. You know, so, and the, the problem is, is sometimes when you start off on that track, people then don't want to pay $10. So it, I'm, I've kind of started to reach out to them a little bit, but yes, I will. I'm going to reach out to them. Um, I know a whole group of young people that are taking, um, at, are in veterinary school on exotic islands and they're bright, brilliant young people. So I'm even thinking some veterinary students when they graduate could come back and join together. You know, once again, the, we're going to see which way the magic falls with some planning, of course, but, you know, I, 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 I want to remain multiple, you know, but still solid. So if that makes any sense at all, that there, I, I sometimes don't really know all the possibilities. I have a lot of ideas and talked with a lot of veterinarians when I went down to the veterinary conference in February. Great, great comments. Thank you, everybody. I'm really appreciating the engagement. And, Does anybody and, else have any questions? Oh, I was just going to say, I popped into your website when I could, yeah, I put um, the phone number and address and stuff in the chat, but um, I did look at adoptable kitties. <laughs> and they're probably <laughs> not current on there because they're, they're probably not out. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Have, Morris is Morris is a really cute cat. I have one just like him at home. That was Morris. Uh, I don't even Morris should have been off of there a while ago. Yeah. So th this is probably the biggest issue I'm having right now. Out at the firm store, we have struggled profoundly with internet. I hope it just got resolved because the T Lab. I've been paying for internet all this time, but we really haven't had great internet to speak of. So the T-Lab was let, just letting us come on to theirs. So hopefully this week we'll get some really, and I have a gal who says she wants to do social media, but I haven't quite seen it happen yet. So if any of you are social media gurus and you want to, and maybe that's a great way to volunteer or say, you know, Kim, that's a lot of work. You, you darn well better buy me a lunch. <laughs> I'm going to say you are so right. <laughs> what is your website? It's cafanimals.org, but it's a little outdated for sure. So I apologize for that. Jane, I did put it in the, it's in the chat. Oh, okay. oh, perfect. And I see something from Madison, something about, can you talk, can you talk about that, Kim? I just saw it pop up really quick about uh, evidence. Compelling evidence that animal and human heart coherence increases the health and well-being of both. Absolutely. And then she put the website, right. safeartmath.org, 100% yes. agree. <laughs> let me turn all of you into, hi, Madison, let me turn, oh, it's you. Hi, darling. Um, let me turn you all into animal lovers. Come on in and see the kittens. <laughs> and I, and I, you're not allowed to smile when you come in. <laughs> Where did you get that big, handsome cat? <laughs> she, we can't hear it because she's on mute, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, that must be tiny. <laughs> So we took in, um, we had a situation where somebody lost her husband, had a profound health crisis, and I don't want to give away, I feel like everything's so confidential, but had um, some cats. And so we were able to help out with some of them. And you go, oh my gosh, these are adults. Who's that spectacular person coming along? There she is right there. There she is. Right, Kim. Kim was the perfect matchmaker. I, I just and and by the way, I'm I'm studying something right now. Many of you may have heard of um, called heart math, um, and it it studies heart 
uh, coherence between the mind, brain, and the body. And there's a wonderful study that shows the connection when the human and the animal come in the, the room at the same time. And the heart rate, just like the heart, it's very, um, could be scientific, but let's just make it really simple. The hearts come, in, come into sync. And this is, um, I believe, why people who do embrace pets in their lives um, do have an ex a longer, longer life expectancy. And if you want it, more information, please contact Kim. Kim, I'm happy to be a conduit. <coughs> um, but it's .org. It's at .heartmath.org. Um, it doesn't matter. The, the, what really does matter is the importance of what these animals are doing for us and that we do for them, it's a two-way street. And, right, can talk, and, and it also too, I, as well as you, Maddie, believe in um, how important that love connection is. So if you all look on our website and go, oh, I want that Siamese, here's what I say to everybody. There's nothing wrong with getting the color you want, but what if you don't get the personality you want? What is the most important to you? Is it that kind of showy cat? Because, you know, the, the black kitty may come up and just purr in here. And I believe that a lot of black kitties are so lovely because they don't have all the colors to flash, just like calicos are a little, um, I'll just say it a little bitchy sometimes. My most difficult cat in there right now is a calico. And one of my more elusive is in a, uh, an orange tip Siamese. I can't think of what the name is right now, but he's actually quite lovely. He's really come around. But you see, just see who falls in love with you. See who you want to throw your money at and whose poopy box you want to clean. Because there's a reason why some of these beautiful animals and purebred animals end up in shelters. And sometimes it's because they're given as gifts and that, you know, it's kind of, I call it like a prearranged marriage. You know, there's no chance for that human to bond because my daughter gave me a canary once out of all things. I was like, I'm just like this canary. I'm just, I'm not feeling the, the canary, you know, isn't that weird? So, I mean, canaries are lovely. Um, I actually found him an amazing home. He was wonderful, but I didn't pick him out. So when we want to do gifts for people, I always suggest think gift certificate. <clears throat> Think coming in like, we're going to go somewhere today and oh, you pull in and see who your partner falls in love with. See who picks you. You know, that, that's really, really critical. And I you offer a companion myself. animal gift certificates. Wouldn't that be a great, beautiful gift for right now? Yes, absolutely. If any of you here, you know, might drop that big hint, you know, to a friend or for a birthday or suggested you know, amount. A, a, yeah, a little a little gift for you. And that that's wonderful. The, um, the thing I want to point out also from a scientific point of view is that when you pet an animal or you touch a person or pet, pet an animal, it causes a release of oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter. And what it does, that's your bonding transmitter. Okay, mm -hmm. so it causes you to bond with whoever you've touched. I mean, waitresses have discovered that if they touch the person that they're serving, <laughs> they get a bigger tip. It's very right. interesting uh, aspect of it. But just a, a little story, when uh, we went, when I first went to see Andy, I went with that, my husband. And because I met Kim in the, in, on the plaza, she told me about Andy. So I went in and I sat down and Andy came over and just leaned on me. And it was like, oh, this is cool. But Kim said, well, Andy's had a bad problem with some men. So you can't have him until your husband comes in and he is okay with your husband. So I dragged Russ in on his birthday in a couple of days <laughs> and Russ sat down and Andy did the same thing. And that was that. And Kim said, yes, you can take him. <laughs> so I want to talk, touch on that, Jane, that is critical. So people will come in without their partners and, um, 
I need, and to, or students will come in. Do you know I will not adopt any animal to a student unless the entire household comes in? Wow, that's kind of strict, isn't it? But what it really is, is it gives me this great opportunity to teach everybody in the household because I can talk, say, Jane, you come in and you live in a household with four other students, right? I can talk to you about hand play and this and that. You take that kitten home and everybody in the house is just like teasing that cat and then it grows up and you've got a really nasty adult cat. Otherwise, or I can get all the students in, have a blast with them, teach. I just did this with a puppy. I told the gal, you have to have all your house. She lived with three guys. They all came in and, and an unknown thing happened. See, I, I don't ever know where stuff, to, to thine own self be true, right? I have to be true to myself. I have to know that at least these animals have, have a good shot at a good life. So what happened is the woman felt that I always, all of our dogs go home on trial. I never do an outright adoption. So they go in trial for three to seven days. So that way there's no pressure on the person or the animal to make it work. And then if it's, I just had a puppy returned, you know, this one that's here, he's such a handful. And I got him in, I, even though I spent about an hour and a half talking to him, they were a totally unskilled family that had never had a puppy, you know, 15, 20 and a mom. And so it was just like, oh, this puppy's overwhelming, but that safety net there is critical because it's gonna affect everybody's life down the road. Well, this puppy with this student, she said what happened was the other dog that was in the household had been living its life in the yard. And she said, as soon as the guy went home after we all talked about dogs, their behavior, being with dogs, never discipline when you're angry, how to discipline, when to discipline. Um, she said he went home, he started walking his dog every day and taking like a whole different level of care of the dog. And I thought, well, I'll be, you know, that wasn't my intention at all. My intention was just to get everybody on the same page for this puppy so that that puppy couldn't have consistency, get its brain screwed, you know, make sure its brain screwed on straight and live its best life. But it, it just, you know, all these consequences sometimes. And, and I'm not saying people get mad at me. Like, you know, I recently had to say, you know, I, I might need, unless you can settle down, I might need to stop this adoption because there was somebody that came to an adoption that was really aggressive with me because he was really mad that I needed him to be there. And, you know, I said, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I don't want to waste people's time. You know, that's not my intention. Um, and I think it ended up being good, but <laughs> not everybody likes it. But yes, yeah, so with your husband, it is important, you know, that when I'm sharing the information, I share it with the household. And the coronavirus has been fun because I've kind of, I've been in people's backyards, I've been in their living rooms, I've done groups. One of the things, if you foster for us and foster, like, say, a mom cat, I just had... Um, the McDonald's, they fostered a mom kitty. She had four kittens and then we snuck two more in there. And I count on foster homes to actually find homes for the kittens. And I'll do like a big group um, Zoom meeting, right? And talk with everybody. And that's what happened in this household. The fosters kept two and she found two other families that each took two. And it's amazing. These kittens are probably about two and a half, three months old now. And they brought them in for their microchips and took them in to get them fixed. And they never had to set their little paws into the adoption center. You know, that's got its own great things and its own downsides. I mean, I will tell you, our kitties are probably some of the friendliest kitties and most well-adjusted because they're out playing with a gazillion other kitties all day right? So they are with adults and kittens, not that many, but you know, a, a lot. Um, so when they go into households, they're very non-threatening and somehow it just seems to work really well. I just put a kitten in, I think, I can't remember if the adult cat was like eight or 14. It's a lovely gal from the co-op. And within a week, it was like, oh, look at them together, you know, and they're buds. And that's unusual when you have an older cat, but our cats are you know, it's just like the well-socialized kid that gets along with everybody. You know, they just kind of come in like Hakuna Matata. I, I like you and oh, I like you and I like you. It works really well. 
But fostering, yeah, we really, um, it's funny, they started teaching classes on this. I was ahead of the Humane Society of the United States because I've been doing this for a long time. You empower your fosters. Sue is on this. Sue, your kitties, you said, are five and six. Back then, I was like, Sue found homes for the kitties that were born at her house. And I think they were born there. Or they were, we gave her a mom and kittens. I can't remember now. But she totally, I was like, do you have a home? She was like, yep, I really like this person. And I count on that. You know, like I said, if, if we talk community, it can't be lip service. Right? Are you finding that... Um it's hard to find enough dogs for the people that yes. want dogs right now? Dogs are an issue right now. They really are, everybody. Be patient. They're, they're there. We've actually, a lot of the puppies that come out of Hoopa are my favorites. There's something about the puppies that come from there I just love. This one is a little exception to the rule, but somehow they have that right mix. I can't explain it. Not their breeds, but the environment. It's everything. And a lot of those puppies have made their way up to Oregon because I guess Oregon has had a real, over the last few years, a real puppy shortage and they ask a fortune for a puppy at certain places up there. But yeah, here I know to that the Humane, Humane Society has had um, like five puppies that were being treated and a list of people who wanted them. So it's very interesting. I'm not really, I used to bring animals in from Oakland. I don't do that anymore because I worry then I will have to refuse local puppies. <laughs> um, and we'll take most, you know, as long as they're small, I don't want somebody's puppy when they've neglected it and it's big and I can't handle it because we don't have the facility like overnight facilities, they have to go into foster homes, which means then somebody else's animals get pounced on. So we are limited, you know, I don't care if they're pit bull puppies or whatever, they just have to be small enough, you know, for the fosters to be able to manage without, you know, getting in a big 70 pound, 10 month old puppy that's going to terrorize everything that somebody didn't train. Those people I will refer to dog trainers because usually it's a behavioral issue. They used to have and worry about puppy mills. Is that no longer a problem? It's getting less and less. Just as I don't know if you all know, some of the last Greyhound racing tracks, they're all closing. And the Greyhound rescue people are now venturing out to Greyhound mixes. And, you know, it's like I say, put me out of business. You know, in a way, it's, it's a good thing to... You know, I'm in a business to, there's a hole in the net in, in the community. That's what nonprofits are, right? We take those, we take those, um, those holes and we just stitch them up a little bit with the best thread that we've got in our, in our, you know, the best thread that we've got. <laughs> so that's what we do. We're not perfect. I know there's other, you know, holes around me that maybe I can't stitch up all the time, but we're really trying. We want to do an ad in the paper that says something like, you've been here for us, we're here for you, or something like that. Um, we're working on it right now. So, yeah. So, whatever you're doing, Sue Durham. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? <laughs> well, it's just a little distracting. <laughs> if you're going to just be there, okay. that's fine. But otherwise, it's kind of distracting. Oh, because movement makes okay. you come on the screen, I think. Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Are Does we... anybody else have any other questions? I think I've got everything. I think I uh, oh, as if I don't have enough on my plate. <laughs> One last thought. Um, I've really been wanting to open a cat cafe, Miss Kitties. So Aww. we have a site. Um, you know, coronavirus hit, which, you know, I really do want to get the mobile up. So that's another reason why the thrift store has to, something's got to give. If we did another thrift store, it would have to be a lot smaller and much more manageable. But Miss Kitty's, the saying will be saving kitties one sip at a time. We want to have extremely Aww. high quality coffee and um, offer an area where people can go and play with kitties and, and uh, adopt them. Where so they would go from our, that? pardon, in Where Arcata. Thinking... The site would be a block off the plaza. I know we talked about that about a year ago. I know. I've been wanting to do it for about a year now. I started, you know, just lightly discussing it back then. 
So that's, you know, let's just see how this, this gal holds up here and we'll see what we can do. Once I get the mobile, I think there was a question about the mobile about, do you have to be doing an internship to work on it? Was that, did you see that question, somebody, Kim, did you see that? The question that I see is, um, is asking if vet students have to um, do an internship. I do believe that in gen, you mean just in general or vet students? Yes, vet yeah. students are required to do an internship. I think in order, I, I believe so because I talked to a couple of them that were across the street at Sunny Bray. So we were taking our kitties over to get their blood drawn. Sunny Bray has been such a great help to us. Um, and um, he came over and he said, oh, we're doing our hours uh, for vet school over there. So how amazing if we could participate in that. You know, we, we just don't know what schooling's looking like. And, um, you know, obviously if we open up a mobile, we want it to be safe um, for everybody. And the nice thing is a, a lot of stuff can actually be done outside with one person on the mobile at a time. Um, you know, a lot of things are a consideration, you know, fomites are something that tr transmits stuff. So if I, you know, cover my nose and cough, and then I go and, you know, touch somebody's face, those are that my hands a fomite, it's transmitting something. So, you know, are animals safe for veterinarians and everybody to be handling when if they're in a household with coronavirus, you know, it's a it's an interest, but I don't coronavirus isn't a very long lived virus. So that's the upshot to it. It's not a very hardy virus like panleukopenia or parvovirus or some of those viruses that um, aren't quite as hardy. That's the if only we're good thing. we're working on it. the street or in the forest with our animals, should we avoid letting them contact each other for, because they might transmit viruses? Um, I would say that the younger, young puppies, it's never, go, or animals that are immunocompromised, it's, you know, young puppies just, they don't have a, a developed immune system. Older animals have a weak, be under no, I mean, vaccines do not protect against everything. I have animals that are vaccinated that get sick. So, but with that said, we can't live in fear and dogs are highly social. And I would say most of the time it's gonna be okay. Those ticks are a concern. You know, I mean, maybe even meeting a tick is probably more of a concern than meeting a dog. So I would say young puppies, if you have young puppies, just make sure there's two types of vaccines. There's modified live and there's killed virus vaccines. We only use modified live. The, it's a slightly riskier to use modified live because they can get a mild form of the disease, but it's way too risky using killed. When you use modified live, you have um, protection three days after that very first vaccine. When you use a killed virus vaccine, you do the vaccine, they get boosted about three weeks later, and then you've got protection a couple weeks after that. So now we're out five weeks, okay? Um, a lot of people say, oh, I got the kennel cough vaccine, but my dog still got it. Well, maybe your dog didn't get it as bad as they would have, right? Um, we use something called an intrabuccal bordetella, which actually just gets placed in the cheek pouch. It's not a vaccine. It's just you literally take the syringe and you aim it at the cheek pouch, and that's where you give the, the bordetella. So I'd love to be able to offer services like come in every Saturday and get a microchip for your pet for like 25 bucks, you know, and a pet tag for five bucks. I mean, that's just... Things are, our space isn't big, so I have to be careful with coronavirus. Well, you know, this, this seeds have been planted and, you know, there's different flowers growing at different times. We'll just see what kind of a garden springs up, right? Some right. withers away and uh, my dahlias are beautiful right now. <laughs> it's right? gorgeous, Ed. It's wonderful to take walks in the forest and even along the streets where everybody's gardens are blooming. I'd so love to meet you all up on the land with your dogs. If you've got um, friendly dogs, that would be so, it's 18 and a half acres and there are trails everywhere. It's really, when the president, when we bought it, came out and looked at it from the Native Plant Society and she brought a couple of people that were in the Native, I can't remember her name, she was so lovely. Um, she said it was one of the prettiest properties she had walked on. And to me, having children immersed in beauty 
helps them to know what to save, right? I always joke with them and say things like, oh, you know, I, gosh, I really love Gap clothes. They're my favorite. They, the jeans fit me the best. And God, we don't have a Gap here. I think we'll just pay paradise and put up a parking lot kind of a thing and they all kind of look at me like I don't really know you but last year I got a little heck about that which I was so glad to see you know that this that the kids were all like really no you know some of them were really speaking up the summer camps are my absolute favorite if any of you have a skill like Marty I will tell you what I did Marty um I had in a person that was legally blind last year so I the kids didn't know she was coming as a guest I blindfolded all the kids and had them eat their lunch. And they did not know that um, she was coming. She walked past them and sat down and she, oh, I just loved her. She said, I'm really enjoying just listening to them while they were eating their lunch, right? So we walked them across the field blindfolded, had them sit down, they had to tell me what their lunch bag looked like. They got it, they had to unzip it, pull out their lunch and then eat their lunch. So then when they took off their blindfold, they met her and she brought a lot of her, oh, she was just stunning. She was just, and she had her dog there with her and talked about her dog and how she got him. And she opened it up to the kids and they got a little personal with their questions. But I find that these real experiences help them to, I'm always thinking, how do I help them to live in, you know, just try on some some other skin for a moment you know how do i help the kids to um like how do you teach kids that dogs don't understand english what do you do you know because they don't i don't know what any of you are thinking and if you start talking in a foreign language you lost me okay and we're all the same species so when kids say no they automatically their brains connect that the dogs understand so what I do is I gave it a lot of thought and I said, huh, let me try this. So I got them all in a big circle and I put a mask on just to, just to throw them off a little bit, just to separate us. And I held a bag of candy and I did this. Moogle, Jane. Jane, Moogle. And then I showed some exasperation, a little frustration. I said it a little more forcefully. Then I went on to another kid. Man, these kids were, I was like telling everybody, wow, nobody's really listening to me. This is getting a little frustrating. So then I went to a girl that's been in the program before and I said, Moogle Grace, she came running over to me. Oh, she got a piece of candy. Yay, yay for Grace. Grace, how did you know to Moogle? She goes, well, I know Moogle means come. I said, how did you know that? And she said, well, you taught us that last year. So every day I would yell Moogle and the kids would literally stampede at me and I would have some little healthy, fun thing to give them. So it's really just telling them, you know, hey, you guys don't understand me. How do puppies who are babies understand you? Because when we do the camp, somehow I get asked to take about 10 to 15 puppies. I've got a beautiful video of the dog trainer up there. The entire back field is filled with kids and dogs and their own dogs from home and all the CAF puppies. So it's a great responsibility to take kids to prepare them for this tremendous responsibility of having these beings. They get kitty certified and it's a wonderful program. It's a, it really is. I, I know I'm tooting my own horn, but obviously I can't do this alone. It's, you know, people are like, oh, CF is so wonderful. You did such a great job. And I go, um, yeah, <laughs> no way do I get all the credit. I'm just the big mouth around it. So, you know, it's, I, I am, and I like that, you know, so, but it's all these beautiful hands. I get text. I've done this. Do you want me to do that? You know, it's so incredible. So join us, everybody. I'm joining this family. Well, thank you, Kim, ever so much. And thank you so much for what you've done and what you're doing. And, and hopefully others will join you to make what your plans are come into fruition. And everybody, thank you ever so much. Okay.